Every one of us has insecurities about our looks, creative powers, masculinity, uniqueness, popularity, etc. Your task is to get a bead on these insecurities through the various conversations you draw your targets into. Once you've identified them, you must be extra careful to not trigger them. People are very sensitive to some words or body language, which triggers their insecurities. Be aware of this. Second, the best strategy is to praise and flatter those qualities that people are most insecure about. Even if we can see through the person who is praising us, that's because we live in a tough world, where we are continually judged. Yesterday's triumph can be tomorrow's failure. We never really feel secure, but if flattery is done right, we will feel that the flatterers like us, and we tend to like people who like us. But the key to successful flattery is to make it strategic. If you know your target is particularly awful at basketball, praising him or her for their basketball skills is useless. But if your target is uncertain about his skills, imagine if your target is perhaps not bad, then any flattery on their score can work wonders. That's why you should look for those qualities people are uncertain about and offer reassurance. But this is very important. Be super careful if your targets are powerful and Machiavellian, because they might feel insecure about their moral qualities. And flattering them about their clever manipulations might backfire, but praising them for their goodness would be too transparent, because they know themselves very well. But instead, some strategic flattery about how you have benefited from their advice or how their criticisms help to improve your performance. This will appeal to their self-opinion of being tough yet fair, with a good heart underneath the gruff exterior. But that's not it. It is always better to praise people for their effort, not for their talent. Because when you praise people for their talent, they feel as if they were simply lucky for being born with natural skill. But instead, everyone likes to feel that they earned their good fortune through hard work. That's where you're going to aim your praise. Because with people who are your equals, you have more room to flatter. But with those who are your superiors, it is best to simply agree with their opinions and validate their wisdom. Because flattering your boss is kind of too transparent. But again, never do this. Never follow up your praise with a request for help or whatever it is you are after. Your flattery is a setup and it requires the passage of some time. Do not appear too ingratiating in the first encounter or two. It's better to show even a little coldness, which will give you room to warm up. After a few days you have grown to like this person, then a few flattering words aimed at their insecurities will begin to melt their resistance. But if possible, get third parties to pass your compliments, as if they had simply overheard them. But never be too lavish in your praise or use absolutes. A clever way to cover your tracks is to mix in some small criticisms of the person or their work. Nothing that will trigger insecurities but enough to give your praise a more realistic hue. I loved your screenplay, although I feel Act 2 might need a little work. Do not say your latest book is so much better than the last one. But again, be very careful when people ask you for their opinion about their work, or something related to their character, or their looks. Because they do not want the truth, they want support and confirmation given as realistically as possible. Be happy to supply this for them. You must seem as sincere as possible. It would be best to choose qualities to praise that you actually admire, if at all possible. In any event, what gives people away is the nonverbal cues praise along with stiff body language or a fake smile or eyes glancing elsewhere. Try to feel some of the good emotions you are expressing so any exaggeration will seem less obvious. But keep in mind that your target must have a relatively high self-opinion. If it is low, the flattery will not jibe with how they feel about themselves and will ring hollow. Whereas for those of high self-opinion it will seem only natural. Use people's resistance and stubbornness. Some people are particularly resistant to any kind of influence. They are most often people with deeper levels of insecurity and low self-opinion. Such types feel as if the whole world is against them. They must protect themselves from any kind of change. You will give them advice, and they will do the opposite. Because they only seek advice to find dozens of reasons why the advice won't work for them. That's why you're going to play a game with them. A mental judo. Because in judo you do not counter people's moves with a thrust of your own, but rather encourage their aggressive resistance in order to make them fall. Use their emotions. In the book Change, the therapist authors Paul Waslowick and others discuss the case of a rebellious teenager suspended from school by the principal because he was caught dealing drugs. He was still to do his homework at home, but was forbidden to be on campus because this would put a big dent in his drug dealing business. The boy burned with the desire to get vengeance. The mother consulted a therapist who told her to do the following, explained to the son that the principal believed only students who attended class in person could do well. In the principal's mind, by keeping the boy away from school he was ensuring he would fail. If he did better by working at home than in class, this would embarrass the principal. Better to not try too hard this semester and get on the good side of the principal by proving him right. Of course, such advice was designed to play into his emotions. Now he desired nothing more than to embarrass the principal and so threw himself into his homework with great energy, the goal of the therapist all along. In essence, the idea is not to counter people's strong emotions but to move with them and find a way to channel them in a productive direction, but also use their language. The therapist Milton Erickson described the following case that he had treated. A husband came to him for advice, although he seemed quite set on doing what he wanted anyway. He and his wife came from very very religious families, and had married mostly to please their parents. The husband and wife were very religious as well. Their honeymoon, however, had been a disaster. They found sex very awkward and did not feel like they were in love. The husband decided it was not anyone's fault but that they should get a friendly divorce. Erickson readily agreed with him and suggested exactly how to bring about this friendly divorce. He instructed him to reserve a room at a hotel. 
They were to have one final friendly night together before the divorce. They were also to have one last friendly glass of champagne, one last friendly kiss between them, and so on. These instructions virtually ensured the wife's seduction by her husband. As Erickson had hoped, the husband followed his instructions, the couple had an exciting evening together, and they happily decided to remain married. Erickson intuited that the husband did not really want a divorce, and that the two of them felt awkward because of their religious backgrounds. They were both deeply insecure about their physical desires, yet resistant to any kind of change. Erickson used the husband's language in his desire for divorce, but found a way to gently redirect the energy towards something much different. When you use people's words back at them, it has a hypnotic effect. How can they not follow what you suggest when it is exactly the words they have used? But that's not it. Use their rigidity. A pawnbroker's son once came to the great 18th century Zen master Hakuin with the following problem. He wanted to get his father to practice Buddhism, but the man pretended to be too busy with his bookkeeping to have time for even a single chant or prayer. Hakuin knew the pawnbroker he was an inveterate miser who was only using this as an excuse to avoid religion, which he considered a waste of time. Hakuin advised the boy to tell his father that the Zen master himself would buy from him each prayer and chant that he did on a daily basis. It was strictly a business deal. Of course the pawnbroker was very happy with the deal he could shut his son up and make money in the process. Each day he presented Hakuin with his bill for the prayers and Hakuin duly paid him. But on on the seventh day he failed to show up. It seemed that he had gotten so caught up in the chanting that he had forgotten to count how many prayers he had done. A few days later he admitted to Hakuin he had become completely taken up with the chants, felt so much better, and did not need to be paid anymore. He soon became a very generous donor to Hakuin's temple. When people are rigid in their opposition to something, it stems from deep fear of change and the uncertainty it could bring. They must have everything on their terms and feel in control. You play into their hands if you try with all your advice to encourage change. It gives them something to react against and justifies their rigidity. They become more stubborn. If you ever encounter this kind of people, do not fight with such people, but use the actual nature of their rigid behavior to effect a gentle change which could lead to something greater. But keep in mind the following. People often won't do what others ask them to do because they simply want to assert their will. If you heartily agree with their rebellion and tell them to keep on doing what they're doing, it now means that if they do so they are following your advice which is distasteful to them. They may very well rebel again and assert their will in the opposite direction, which is what you wanted all along the essence of reverse psychology. 